Okay, we're going to start with chemistry, and the first item that we have is atoms, ions, and molecules. So let's just start with a chemical element. An element is the simple form of uh, matter. Matter occupies a space and have unique uh, properties. Okay, let's take a look at some of the elements that we have in our body. For example, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, right? Those see, you see examples in there, as well as some other examples of elements. So if we scroll down, we can see the atomic structure of uh, the elements, and we can see that all the elements are going to have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right here, you can see the nucleus with protons, neutrons, and electrons, and flying around in energy levels, as you can see right here, or shells, they're going to be the electrons. The number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus is going to be the atomic mass. The number of protons only is going to be the atomic number. If you can see this example right here, you can see right here the nucleus and the electrons flying around. So this is carbon. In the nucleus, we say we have protons, six, neutrons, six. And we said that's the atomic mass. And electrons are going to be the same as the number of protons, six, right here. Uh, sometimes this number of neutrons changes to seven neutrons, eight neutrons, nine neutrons. And in those cases, this carbon is going to be uh, there. Is, this carbon is going to have isotopes. The isotopes are the same as the same element with different number of neutrons. This excess number of neutrons is going to be uh, unstable because we said that 666 makes the carbon stable. But since now it's going to have seven, eight, or nine, now it's going to be unstable. So what the carbon is going to do to try to become stable again is going to release radio iso radiation. Okay, this radiation that is going to eliminate is going to turn this carbon into a more stable form. So if the carbon has seven, eight, or nine neutrons, then that means that this excess of neutrons is going to release radioactivity. And now these carbons with different numbers of neutrons are going to be called radioisotopes. It's going to be a radioisotope because it's going to release radiation. Okay, so as we scroll down, we see right there isotopes and radioactivity because isotopes is the element with different number of neutrons and this excess number of neutrons is going to release radioactivity, making this uh, isotope now into a radio isotope, as you can see right here, radio isotopes. Radio isotopes, as I said, they are going to release radiation. Right here, radiation. Physical half-life is, since they release radiation, that means that they decay. So the amount of time that takes for an isotope to, be, to release 50% or decay 50%, is called the physical half-life, okay? The biological half-life is the amount of the radioisotope that it takes, the amount of time that it takes for the radioisotope to decay 50% in the human body. We scroll down, we're gonna see ions, electrolytes, and free radicals. Ions are particles with an equal number of protons and neutrons. Okay, let's take a look in here. So right here, you have sodium and chlorine. The electrons are negative. So sodium is going to lose this electron and it's going to give this electron to chlorine. Now chlorine is going to have one more negative that came from here. So therefore the chlorine is going to become more negative. And sodium lost this electron. Therefore it becomes less negative or more positive because you're going to have more number of protons. When you become more positive, you're going to be called a cation. And if you become more negative, you're called an anion, as you can see right here. So we have cation if it uh, has more positives, and it's going to be an anion if it has more negatives, in this case, the chlorine. Now, what is the force that is going to put together these two that is going to make this possible? When this element, I mean, electron goes from sodium to chlorine, these two are going to get together by a force called a bond. So when elements get together, they form bonds. What is the bond? Is the energy necessary in order to put these elements together. So in the case of the sodium and chlorine, when you put them together, you've, you're going to form sodium chloride, which is your regular table salt. Okay. So if we keep scrolling down, we're going to see right here electrolytes. What happens when you put sodium chloride in water? The sodium chloride, the salt, is going to separate, is going to ionize into 
uh, an anion and a cation, which is the chlorine and the uh, sodium. In that case, these electrolytes, they become electrolytes. When they disassociate in water, they become electrolytes, and they have the ability to, trans to transfer electricity. That's why they are called electrolytes. And that's what you get, for example, when you drink uh, Gatorade. Okay, what you have in there is electrolytes, which, is, which are going to be, you know, in this case, the sodium and the chloride in water. So if you, uh, you go and scroll down, you see in there some examples of electrolytes. Free radicals are stable substances, stable particles, that uh, they are going to get an extra electron. So you see here, for example, oxygen. That's a stable, but it gets an extra electron and now becomes unstable. You see here the negative because again it get one electron. So these are stable and they are very very bad in our body. Okay, they destroy many uh, organic substances that we have in our body. Therefore, they need to be stopped or they need to be changed into more stable situ uh, uh, substance. And that's why we are going to use in our body anti antioxidants in order to achieve that particular purpose. Let's scroll down and we see molecules and chemical bonds. We already talked about one of them, which is the ionic bond. When I mentioned the example of the sodium chloride, the irregular table salt. In that case, one of them, the chlorine, got the electron from the sodium. Right? So then the chlorine became an anion and the sodium became cation. In addition to the ionic bond, you also have other bonds, which are going to be the covalent bond, hydrogen bond and van der Waals forces. So let's take a look at the covalent bond. In the case of the covalent bond, you are going to have elements in which they are basically the same, and they are going, they are going to be the same size. So they're going to share the same number of electrons. In this case, you have the hydrogen, it has one electron. The other hydrogen has one electron. So in order for this hydrogen to get two electrons, it needs to share this electron with this other hydrogen. So as you can see here, they both share, and now they have two electrons. Since they share, this is a covalent uh, bond. In the case of the ionic bond, as we have seen before, they don't share. In this case, the chlorine gets one electron from the other element, in this case, sodium. So let's go back. Again, in covalent, they share. So you have in here carbon sharing two electrons, oxygen sharing two electrons. So that's why you see four in here and four in here. And this is going to be carbon dioxide. If we scroll down, we can see right here that covalent bonds can be polar or nonpolar. Right here in nonpolar, that substances, the two uh, elements are going to share, right? And the sharing is going to be, let's say, 50 and 50%. In the polar covalent bond, you see here they share, but the sharing is not equal. This one is so big compared to this other one right here that this big oxygen is going to attract the element, the electrons that the hydrogen has towards this side, and because of that, is going to form negative area and a positive area. In other words, a negative pole and a positive pole, and that's why this is called polar covalent. Okay, the next item is hydrogen bond. Obviously, it goes without saying, I think, that in order for you to have a hydrogen bond, you have to have a substance that contains hydrogen. Let's talk about this. This is water. So what you see in blue right here is one molecule of water. So how many molecules of water you have? One, two, three, and four. What forms water? A covalent bond. So you can see here inside the blue, you have the covalent bond. But in between the blue areas, you see here this dotted line. This dotted line is showing you the hydrogen bond, which is formed in between two molecules of water because the molecule of water itself is formed by the covalent bond. Okay, and then if we keep going down, we see here Van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces are just forces. They are weak and brief uh, attractions in between uh, atoms. And it's necessary to, for example, form proteins, in the case of protein folding. Okay, and that's about it. Okay, the next item is water and mixtures. We're already seeing what the chemical composition of water is and what are the bonds that are going to form. That's what this is what we have seen, where you have covalent bond forming the in between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Okay, we already talked about that. And water is very important in the human body, as you know, more than 
or almost more, almost 70% of the human body is water. Substances that are going to be able to dissolve in water are going to be called hydrophilic, as you can see here, and substances that don't dissolve in water are going to be called hydrophobic because water has very important properties, such as what being the universal solvent, which is going to give you hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances. Okay, so in addition to that, another concept that our properties that water has is going to be addition and cohesion. Addition is, uh, you have the term right here, addition, right, which is the tendency of substances of cling to one another. Like, for example, if you have a glass of water, addition would be the, the, uh, the ability of the molecules of water to cling to one to another, right? And cohesion, as you can see here, would be the water trying to, uh, to cling to the glass itself, okay? So then that's the term, uh, those are what those terms mean. It has a very important uh, chemical reactivity because a lot of chemical reactions happens due to the presence of water and thermal stability as well, because you need a lot of energy in order to increase the temperature. Okay, and that's a very important example of why water is, war is used as a coolant, for example, in engines, in the car. Okay, you need a lot of temperature in order to raise the temperature of water. The next item is gonna be solutions, colloids, and suspensions, okay? Solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Solution is composed of solute and solvents, where solutes can be sugar, salt, right? and solvent most of the time is water. What we need to talk about this because there's a very important uh, solution in our body, which is gonna be blood. Right here, you see examples of blood. And right here, we have the graphical representation of that. Our blood is a suspension. As you know, the blood is going is a fluid. It's a red fluid. Why is it a fluid? Because it contains water. And why is it red? Because it contains a whole bunch of red blood cells. It's called a suspension because the red blood cells are suspended in that water. When this suspension is put in a centrifuge, the centrifuge will spin, and all the red blood cells will go to the bottom. Why? Because they were suspended in the water. Now, as you can see here, all the red blood cells at the bottom, you know water is crystal clear. Then how come this is not show as crystal clear or translucent? Because in water, you're going to have other substances in your blood, such as, for example, proteins. These proteins, even though you are spinning the blood, the proteins will not fall to the bottom like the red blood cells. This water mixed with proteins is a colloid. Once the substances mix with water and they can be separated, it turns into a colloid. So a suspension is when they are mixed like this, but these red blood cells will go to the bottom. So in that case, they are suspended. But when they are mixed, but they cannot be separated anymore, then this becomes a colloid, okay? Colloid suspensions, they all vary basically depending on the uh, particle size. But for purposes of what we need to understand in this class is just you know, that substances can be separated or they cannot be separated because they are basically floating, right? That's a suspension. And if they are floating in the fluid, but they cannot be separated, then that's gonna be a colloid. If we keep scrolling down, we're gonna get to acid, bases, and pH. Okay, so what is pH? The pH is the number of hydrogens in a solution. As you can see here, derived from the molarity of hydrogen. So pH got to do with hydrogen. You can see right there the formula of pH. Right? It says in here pH is a negative log of concentration of hydrogens. Right? And pH shows you in there seven. Why? Because seven is neutral, as you can see right here. So everything that goes from zero to seven is called acidic. Everything from seven to 14 is called basic. So that means that these substances in here have more hydrogen. That's why you see here you have lemon, right? which is very acidic. What happens if you put your fingers in acid, for example, you're gonna get burned. What happens if you put substances that are very basic, you're gonna get burned as well, okay? So what is seven? Water, neutral. In our case, what we need to know is the blood, the uh, pH of blood is gonna be 7.35 to 7.45, which is almost neutral, it's right here, right? It doesn't get to eight, okay? So the number of hydrogens that is gonna give you the pH is measured based on concentration. Now, how can this concentration be expressed? Well, it can be expressed in molarity, in uh, percentage, weight per volume, 
And if you scroll down, you can see that in here, other measures of concentration, weight per volume, percentage, molarity, etc. 